Welcome to Wind Tubber and the Whales. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so the Wind Tubber is celebrating its 50th anniversary, 5-0, this year. Woo! With, <laughs> with the Blue Whales. Um, so those of you that don't know me, my name is Lisa Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Wind Hover Performing Arts Center. Um, Michael Fishback has started the Great Whale Conservancy in 2010. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. The whales need help. They're, the preservation of the species is um, a, it's, it's endangered, and Michael will, will address that. This is the first of what I hope are many different events that Wind Hover will sponsor, focusing on the natural world, the ocean, um, the precious resources that we need to be able to protect and maintain. And with, <laughs> with that, I'd like to introduce Michael Fishback. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Great to see everybody. I wanted to give uh, a couple of thank yous and nods before we go off on our journey of discovering blue whales, which most people in the world know very little about, even though they are the biggest amongst us. Uh, first of all, um, I would not be here without my friends up in Quebec, both at the um, GREM in Tadoussac and the Mingan Island Cetacean Study in Mingan. Richard Sears, in particular, was a big mentor to me. Um, and, uh, you know, th there's always a, a road that brings someone to where they are. And those people deserve a big kudu and a big thanks. And also in this very community here, um, I'm sure almost everyone here is aware of Ocean Alliance. Ocean Alliance and Ian Kerr, who's amongst us, are have become better and better friends, collaborators at times. We've done field work together. We've uh, done other things together, and um, we greatly support what they are doing. I think uh, their mission and our mission, although it's not exactly the same, we're here to try to bring the whales back, save the whales, and increase the health of the ocean. And we're understanding more and more and more, and I hope when you leave, you will understand the critical role that whales play in the health of the ocean. Boy, did we blow it when we killed all those whales in more ways than one. We really blew it as a species. Anyway, time to go off on a journey uh, to meet the blue whale and a few other creatures that we, that we know in Baja. This will be my 24th year of going to Baja, California. Um, a long time ago, maybe 23, 24 years ago, I had my first experience where I was in a small boat, it was stopped. I was waiting for a blue whale to surface, and the blue whale surfaced maybe 50 meters from my boat. Bullseye, dead on, pointed right towards the boat. And I thought, okay, well, you know, they take a series of breaths when they come to the surface. On the next breath, he's gonna be pointed in another direction. And on the next breath, he was pointed directly towards our boat, about 25 meters from the boat. And then on the next breath, it was about 10 meters. And you were talking, you know, probably an 80-footer, maybe an 85-footer. And suddenly, this whale seemed to put on the brakes. Its whole body contorted in a slow-motion turn as if it sort of to me, just realized that we were there, but avoided us and glided with its whole massive, beautiful body right by our boat. And I tell you that story because I think, for me, of all the statistics about blue whales, and literally every one is incredible. Every single statistic about this animal is incredible. For me, the most incredible one is that in the history of humans and whales, as far as we know, there has never been a death caused from a single human being by a blue whale, and there's never been a serious injury documented and proved to have been caused ever, ever, anywhere in the world, one time, by any blue whale. And we killed hundreds of thousands of them, and today, there's whale watching and there's boats all over the world in locations, in locations where there are blue whales and yet somehow this really seems to be the true gentle giant that we've ever had on this planet. I, I, I just find it amazing that there has never been harm 
caused purposefully by a blue whale to a person. That being said, a blue whale got hit by a boat in Baja this year. Mike, you might want to know that, by a fishing boat, and two people got projectiled like a missile out of the boat. The boat was flying, and the blue whale was just breathing. Blue whale didn't do anything, and somebody did get hurt, but it wasn't caused by the blue whale. It was caused by the people. So anyway, here we go on a journey, and uh, I haven't really rehearsed much for this journey, but we have, uh, we have the pictures to take me along. So this is a blue whale breathing in Baja. I want to take you, um, uh, uh, I'll talk about the Great Whale Conservancy a little later on, our nonprofit, which is dedicating to helping the plight of the world's great whales with a special emphasis on the blue whale, or saving the blue whale. Um, and I believe that the blue whale is critically endangered, and I'll get to that and admit it. I don't, in a minute, I don't, don't go for this endangered thing. It's critically endangered, and it's in, it's in serious trouble if we don't start to bring the numbers back up. And I'll give you my support for that a few minutes down the road. So I go to Baja, California at this point in my career. This will be my 24th year. It's the cactus capital of planet Earth. The largest species in the world is the Cardone. That's me standing next to a Cardone. There are many Cardones that big in Baja. And it's an incredibly young sea and an incredibly rich sea. And the diversity of whales is astounding. But our most common whale is the blue whale over my 24 years. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of the life in Baja before we begin the other life, before we begin our blue whale journey. So we have bottlenose dolphins, and they are great jumpers there. I've seen them jump 20 feet or more. We have on windy days when we cannot go out. And imagine this. Say there's right whales off the shore here. And you're going to go out and see right whales, but you can't go on a certain day because it's too windy. Well, you're going to sit around and wait for tomorrow. Not in Baja. In Baja, we drive two hours across the peninsula, and we go pet gray whales. So when we have an off day, we go pet gray whales in their nursing lagoons in one of only three places in the world where you reliably can pet large whales. This picture was taken of a gray whale calf by my 10-year-old son. Those lice that you see along its mouth line are endemic to gray whales. They live on planet Earth, no place else except on the bodies of gray whales. Uh, we have great humpback feeding shows in Baja. This one I took, oh, uh, I can't remember, within the last three years. I remember this was the first day of the year. It was a humdinger of a first day. And you can see all the baleen. So here's baleen on the, on the upper jaw, on the upper palate here, and uh, the ventral pleats distend, distended from the weight of all the water in the krill in the lower jaw. This one was taken by my teenage daughter uh, probably about six or seven years ago. We have the Sea of Cortez is a sea. It's not the ocean. When the wind doesn't blow, uh, you could shave. You could look over the bow of the boat literally and shave without cutting yourself. It's just there's a lot of flat weather there most years, not every year. So this was just one of those great reflections of a humpback that stayed with us for a long time. Stayed, it chose to stay with us for at least a half an hour. We have sperm whales offshore. Sometimes they come onshore. Sometimes they're curious. And we only see them in good squid years, which we haven't had for the last four years. So I think it's been five years. Uh, I feel like it's due. I feel like my next sperm whale encounter was due. This was part of an encounter of 70 sperm whales. Yeah, and again, you can see the rough water conditions. Uh, orcas have really come on. In my first 20 years down there, we had seven orca encounters. In my last three years, we've had seven orca encounters. I have seen 20 orcas kill a Brutus whale, take it down and eat it. Um, that was in 2000. Uh, the orcas are great. We're starting to get a lot of re-sightings, and it's really, really exciting to see the orcas and the behavior of the other cetaceans when the orcas are around. Um, so I do a lot of work with a pole cam. I have a camera on the bottom of the pole cam, and um, this particular picture, um, while it was taken, uh, here's some of the video that I got.
Okay, so um, if this next slide plays immediately without um, Kath, sorry, Cindy, without Cindy clicking on the button, you got to be ready. It's only 10 seconds long. It was taken as a video by my 10-year-old son. He, it, but it's you got to be ready for this one. Go ahead, get ready. Right here. So we've had we've had a lot of orcas hunting rays. Um, we have had large parts of orcas herding and hunting hundreds of rays. Um, and there are times when you can somewhat predict when they're vertically trying to stun rays where that's going to happen by looking at the wingtips of the rays. So I actually had the whole boat set up for this. I didn't know it was going to happen, but everyone on the boat got a video. I, this is just a picture that I love to show because you just don't see pictures like this. And there's probably enough people in the room here to know that this is not a crocodile and it's actually a humpback whale. But, you know, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. And, and <laughs> those tubercles have hairs and actually you can see one of the hairs. In case you didn't know, most of you probably do, all cetaceans have hair because all mammals have hair. Some of them have about as much hair as me. <laughs> we are meeting the blue whale, the largest of all the large, and they even have big heads, this one coming right at our boat, and we're going to meet them today both above the surface and under the surface. Um, yes, we're going to meet them above and below, and they are just magnificent animals. There isn't a blue spot on their body. They are silver gray and silver and they turn the water blue. There's something about most, not all water that they're in, but most water, where when you see them gliding under the surface of the water, it turns this ethereal kind of blue color. It can be a turquoise blue, it can be various shades of blue, but that's how they got their name. Um, we get some close encounters next to the boat. Now, keep in mind here that you are not even coming close to seeing the whole body of this adult blue whale. And this is a, this is a female. Four humpbacks to make a blue whale. Every now and then, blue whales come up in just the right spot. Just the right spot. That's a shield volcano called Coronado, and at, we did not move our boat. We were stuck still waiting for a blue whale to come up, and it just dove, framing Coronado perfectly. It's the only time that's ever happened. The fluke is about 22 feet from tip to tip. Okay, this is a really important thing, this part of the show, because I usually don't do this. We don't know blue whales as individuals. This is one of the most difficult things about us helping the blue whale is that they're blue whales, but they're not individuals. But guess what? When you work in the same area for 24 years in a row, a lot of those individuals become old friends and animals that you have seen with calves and without calves and doing all sorts of things. And I'm going to introduce you now to six or seven of our most well-known blue whales. This first one is Star. This is a right side photo ID of Star. The scenery is horrible in Baja, so I'm sorry, don't pay attention to it. But um, this is a right side ID of Star. Star is a female seen with a calf in 2009 and in 2011 and 2017 without a calf. And she is the only adult blue whale I've ever met that regularly approaches boats. You have your engine off. I've never seen another blue whale do that, but Star has done it lots. This is Machete, a male that we've known since the 80s. And um, interestingly enough, this individual whose, whose chop marks on its fluke I've seen grow larger and larger over the years, somehow attracts calves of blue whales and fin whales, and there's trouble in the water when the calves come over by machete. I, I can't explain it, I'm not gonna try to explain it, but I've seen it with both blue whale calves and fin whale calves, and this is a known male, don't forget. Um, never seen anything like it again before. I've never seen a male blue whale that has calves that come up and hang out with it before, or since, or ever. This is Umbrella. 
and because it really looks like an umbrella. But, and, and blue whales drop a lovely, lovely waterfall. Umbrella, this is not a photo ID, but this is a photo ID, and it's the same whale fluke. And umbrella is the only blue whale I've ever seen that has a two-pointed prong on both lobes of its fluke. And let me tell you, I've seen a lot of blue whale flukes. I've never seen this on any other one. Umbrella's real sporadic. I've seen her maybe three or, uh, sorry, don't know if it's a male or a female. Three or four different years down in Baja. Okay, hook. Hook is a male known since 1984, and hook is a large male, and hook is a dark male. And hook is the first blue whale that I've ever seen five years in a row. And this year, when we didn't have a lot of blue whales, we saw hook, and it was year number five in a row, and we broke the record. One other interesting thing about hook, killer whale teeth marks on the caudal peduncle. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Sorry, all other blue whales in the world. This is the most famous blue whale on Earth, and it's not even a close contest. This is white eyes. There are people in this room that, who knows white eyes? Raise your hand if you ever met white eyes. <laughs> Ian, you met white eyes. Yeah. So white eyes has, is a male. Uh, he's shown up on, I think, 14 out of my 23 years. He has probably the most recognizable blue whale fluke in the world, other than one that might be chopped off or something. And he's never yet not shown up when I've had an official film crew that was airing something <laughs> on TV or on the big screen. And I, and I am not making that up. He has shown up every time that there's been a film crew there. And, he, and we didn't see him this year. And last but not least, Oh no, two more. This is a, this is a really interesting whale, sex unknown. Um, Richard Sears and I first saw this whale, I think in the 90s, maybe he had seen it in the 80s before that. This whale is called Slice. And interestingly enough, in the scar, uh, the pigmentation is completely intact. And you notice how these whales have this pattern of pigmentation on the side of their body, and it's unique to each whale, and that's how we identify blue whales along with the fluke, if and when they fluke. But most blue whales don't fluke, or lift their fluke out of the water when they dive. So Slice is, uh, I love seeing Slice, he, has a, he or she has a habit of right before they take their terminal dive, they take a breath, they put their blowhole under the water and they exhale, and they shoot water about 30 or 40 feet up in the air, a stream of water. And we've seen Slice do that on different years. So this is something that Slice does. And I don't know what caused it, but my, guess, my best guess is a rope. Um, a, a rope when it was young and it healed somehow cleanly and the pigmentation came back like your fingerprint would come back, but I, I don't know. Okay, last but not least, the one and only oldest known blue whale on planet Earth, Nubbin, a male known since 19... I hate to say it, 70, from a tourist picture. Um, we've got over half a century on this whale. Um, and since we haven't proven how long they live, we, uh, you know, we, we like seeing Nubbin, let's just put it that way. And we like increasing the knowledge on Nubbin's life. We're pretty sure they live to be about as old as we do. Okay, now our journey's gonna change. Um, we're going to start to get into some of the more serious matters uh, involving these animals, but we're still going to see a lot of beautiful stuff. Now, I want to say before anyone starts taking pictures and publishing this slide that this is a non scientifically published slide produced by me. I put a lot of time into it. I spoke to a lot of people all over the world that work on blue whales, and by no means is it meant to be 100% accurate, and by no means do we begin to suggest that blue whales do not swim out of these rectangles and squares and go in other places. But, um, and the different color here is because this is the latest edition, the New Zealand uh, population, but I want to get into why I think the blue whale is critically endangered. 
So we started with an accepted about 350,000 before the era of whaling. If you add these numbers up, you'll probably get somewhere between 11 and 12,000. There might only be 8,000, there might only be 7,000, there might be 15,000, there might be 18,000. Nobody really knows, but there are pitifully few blue whales compared to what they used to be. But it's actually even worse than that, because as this map illustrates, they live in genetically poor remnant island populations, that, coined, co that term coined by me. So if you don't like it, you can yell at me. Genetically poor remnant island populations. Think about what that means. There isn't genetic interchange. So we could say there's 12,000 blue whales in the world. That sounds bad, but it doesn't sound as bad as there's hardly any place where, where there's more than 1,000 or 1,500. And what happens if some calamity strikes that particular subpopulation, it's gone. So I consider them to be, and I stand by it, anyone can disagree with me that wants, I consider this to be a critically endangered species. And it's the biggest species that's ever lived and we need them. And you're gonna learn a little bit more why we need them. This is how, uh, officially, how we photo ID blue whales because this is the Northeast Pacific blue whale catalog, an actual page from that catalog. So this is kind of how that's done. We've got a picture from the Santa Barbara Channel and roughly 15 to 1,700 nautical miles away, we've got my picture from, from the Sea of Cortez. And it's very clear to see with the two white dots and you know this formation here with the tail and the eye being here, you know, every formation matches up and it's the same individual taken four years apart. So that's how, you know, that's the tough work that dedicated research groups that keep catalogs of blue whales do. I don't do th that work. I support that work. They need all the support they can get, and I support it with field data, and anybody gets my field data. I don't care who it is. If they're doing work on blue whale population or, or, or cataloging, they get my data. Okay, the only place in the world where we have a regular record or semi-regular record of blue whales on both ends of their migration. Okay, let's think about that, both ends of their migration. So most of those places you saw before, we know some whales on one end of their migration. And actually their migration might be a triple migration for all we know. But in the Northeast Pacific, we know a lot of whales from Baja, California, and we know a lot of whales from California. And I used to believe they all went back and forth. Not true, it's only about 50%. But for that 50%, we've got them on both ends of their migration. Rare in the blue whale world. White eyes in seaside California, deep in Monterey Bay. White eyes by me in Baja. They're very far from each other. This is very different times of the year, both ends of the migration. Just, it's kind of interesting to see that. Mothers and calves. You can't really give a blue whale presentation without talking about mothers and calves. Yeah, those little tiny calves, they're born at 22 to 25 feet. They weigh, I don't even know how many tons, six or seven tons when they're born. They gain a measly 215 to 220 pounds a day from nursing the world's richest milk. That's a ton every nine and a half days. It might sound like a lot, but guess what? You don't get to weigh 300,000 pounds by gaining 10 pounds a day. It just doesn't happen. You can get your calculator out on that one. The calf stays with mom for about seven months. There's a split up. Nobody knows exactly how that works. We just know that mom and calf show up back in Baja the next year separately, having nothing to do with each other. And, you know, there's something going on up in California or wherever they go where there's a split up. And wouldn't it be great to hear a blue whale up here instead of poor old me telling you about all those details? Okay, we're gonna get into feeding now. A very important part of the blue whale world is feeding. Um, it's not a great thing for blue whales that they're specific feeders on krill, or almost specific feeders on krill. However, it is good news that there's incredibly rich protein in krill, and there's a lot of krill in the world, although not as much as there should be. 
So this is a blue whale lunging right next to our boat in the, in the Sea of Cortez. You can see the upper pallet, the baleen, and you can actually see krill in the water, the lucky ones that got away. Here's the ventral pleats, which can be dark or can be light. That's a pigmentation differentiation from one blue whale to the next. They're not all dark like that. This is just the next picture in the sequence. Again, the water dripping down, the, uh, the, the uh, baleen here, and all the krill in the water trapped in the, in the lower jaw. And the whale has a big job to get that out. And somebody told me I would have won wildlife photograph of the year if that eye had been open. <laughs> but I think it's kind of interesting that you've got a feeding blue whale here and the eye is closed because we know that these animals see by sound primarily. But look at this. Here you go. This animal has just lunged for a mouthful of krill, and its eye is closed, unfortunately. God, that would have been beautiful if that eye was open. And this is cheating. I'm sorry. It's not cheating because I didn't take the picture. I did, but it's a fin whale. It's not a blue whale. But it is so darn hard to get the sunlight pouring in to the jaw of a, of a lunge feeding whale. And we worked for hours this day to do it, and we did it. So I'm showing you a fin whale. And I've heard a few curses from biologists that say, God darn that water there, I'd be able to see further into the gullet than I've ever seen before if it wasn't for that darn bit of water blocking it there. Anyway, stalk barnacles, ventral pleats way over here. Um, and a beautiful picture of the lower jaw of a lunge feeding fin whale. So this is our boat. This is our, you know, if, you, if, if anybody comes with us and survives it, you're on a boat like that. And here's two blue whales. This one's got its pouch full. We've got a drone up. And this one's spouting. And, um, you know, we're just sort of the little guys on the block. And, and everything seems to go well, right? Because we know that they never harm humans. And I, I love, I feel very safe when there's blue whales around. I've never really had a problem. And I've spent thousands, many thousands of hours in the presence of blue whales in my life. I have figured that out. It's many thousands. The whale pump, marine mammals, enhance primary productivity in a coastal basin. What we're basically talking about here is the blue whale and other large whales role in enhancing primary productivity in the ocean. We will be talking a little bit more about that in the coming minutes. F primary production is phytoplankton, critical to all of our lives, critical to the oxygen content of, of the planet that we live on, and critical to every single thing that lives in the ocean, the base of the food chain in the ocean. So I'm just going to read you the beginning of this one. A uh, scientific paper by an Australian, Jay Willis. Whales maintained a high abundance of krill. Both are ecosystem engineers in the Southern Ocean. First sentence. Krill abundance was predicted to rise after the end of commercial whaling in the Southern Ocean due to the release of predatory pressure from two million whales that were killed between 1915 and 1970. So this is between 1915 and 1970. But contrary to expectations, there has actually been a substantial de decline in the abundance of krill since the end of whaling. Hmm. Hmm. So we go out and we collect feces of whales. Uh, we don't process them. Places like the Harvard lab that we've done a bunch of work with process them. Uh, this is a blue whale poop breaking down, very rich in iron, phosphorus, and nitrogen. Interestingly enough, those three minerals are essential for phytoplankton to bloom. They mix with nutrients that upwell from the bottom of the ocean seasonally here and there in this and that part of the world, and miraculously phytoplankton blooms. Guess who knows where those upwellings are going to happen? You think blue whales know where those next upwellings are going to happen? That's where they migrate to. When they leave an area where that system breaks down, they migrate to the area where historically those upwellings ha happen, and they poop in them, releasing the essential minerals that are necessary for phytoplankton. That's not the only way those minerals get in 
to the nutrients from that upwelling, but it's a very important way. And we're trying to quantify now how important, exactly how important. So we collect the poop, we put it in vials, we label the vials. We even give some of those vials to Ocean Alliance right here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And we try to find out what the heck we can find out from these secretive but amazing animals. And we will all die and there will be things that we don't know. Um, I'd love to see a blue whale give a presentation. I'd fly halfway around the world for it. But I don't know if that's going to happen. So. Um, sperm whales really let it fly. I mean, they really let it fly when they get going. Thank you, Tony Wu, one of my best friends in the whale world, who took this picture. Um, it's incredible. And again, they're just full of the essential minerals that are necessary for phytoplankton to bloom. Millions of whales made a difference in the ocean. A real difference in the ecosystem and the chemistry of the ocean. And when we took them out of the ocean, it was a very big problem. And climate change and everything else that the ocean helps us with, oxygen content, is, you know, it's sacrificed to a certain extent because the whales are just not there. So this is yet another reason why we are fighting to bring the whales back. But honestly, we just love the whales. All, you know, we think, we, we don't talk to the industry about this, but I mean, they deserve to live. And there's a whole eco, uh, um, there's a whole economy that is built around whales just from tourism. But there is a critical role that they play in all of our lives and in the life of every fish that you've ever eaten out of the ocean. And here's a meager phytoplankton bloom in case you've never seen one. You can't see the end of this bloom because of the clouds. And it's just a small little peninsula here. That one's Ireland. This is south, uh, southwest England here. Um, you know, phytoplankton blooms in massive blooms, massive blooms. It's, a, it's the, the greatest photosynthesis mechanism on planet Earth, more than all of the veg vegetation on land combined. Um, produces about half of the oxygen that we breathe, possibly a little more than half. Okay, why are blue whales not increasing since we stopped killing them 50 years ago, except for three weeks ago in Iceland when they purposefully killed one. Why are they not increasing? They're not increasing prim primarily because of ship strikes, and it might be totally because of ship strikes. So I took this picture in the shipping lane off the coast of California, one of the worst places on planet Earth in your country and mine for ship strikes on large whales. Let me repeat, one of the worst places on planet Earth for ship strikes on whales in the whole darn world is in our country, and nobody really does anything about it. People meet, they talk about it, they, they do things that don't really save the whales' lives. They make minor differences. There have been actually a couple of good things that have been done, so I shouldn't say they do nothing. But right now, this season, right now in August, the blue whales are getting hammered again. Um, they've had a, a benefit. They actually have had one really good benefit up in the Bay Area that's been done, so we can talk about that later. But we are to blame, just like many other places in the world are to blame. Whales are getting killed in our country. And it's happening today, last week, tomorrow, and it's been happening for a long time. And it's not good because the blue whales are not recovering. Here's a blue whale spouting near a container ship. I also took this in the shipping lane. Here is a really interesting one because this is a picture I took. I was on a project with the Sea Shepherd. And we've got the lower jaw of a lunge feeding blue whale, ventral pleats here. And we can actually see the infrastructure of the port of Los Angeles right there. I mean, three miles away where those massive ships go in to offload and unload and, and, and onload. And this is why we can't move these shipping lanes. There is another answer, though, and we're working on it, and we're going to get to that very shortly. We can't move the shipping lanes because when they're feeding three miles outside of where the ships enter the biggest port in North America, there's no place to put those shipping lanes. And this is a really important economic bit, bit of economic infrastructure on our continent, the port of LA and Long Beach. 
Shipping lanes can be moved. They have been moved. Um, it takes a nation with guts to put a proposal through to the International Maritime Organization when they know whales are getting hit and they want to avoid those whales by shifting the lanes. Panama did it. It took very little time. It was for humpbacks. Southern Panama Canal, it's a done deal. And this is what it looks like. A lot of satellite tags on humpback whales, humpbacks up on the beaches, knowing that there's a lot of bad places for those lanes to be, and they found a good place. The government went for it. They requested to the IMO for the lanes to be moved. It took less than a month. Done deal. Many humpback lives being saved in Panama since that's happened. Not many countries have had the guts to do it yet. I think it's going to start, the, the dominoes or the ducks are going to start to fall, and we're in the thick of it trying to make it happen. This is unfortunately what it looks like when a whale gets hit midships by a container ship. If they don't get hit midships and the whale, which this is a fin whale, doesn't wrap around the bow of the boat, then the whale just dies and all these whales are negatively buoyant. So probably 96 or 7 percent of the time they just sink to the bottom of the ocean. Every now and then one, one is found on the beach or in the currents, but it's rare. Here's a really sad story that happened about a month ago. This was the eighth necropsy that the California Academy Marine Sciences necropsy team has done this year. They're based in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. This was, and it almost brings me to tears, a juvenile, sexually immature female blue whale. Completely confirmed, killed by a ship. How about all the calves this whale was going to have? How many calves was this whale going to have in a population that is hurting and not increasing and severely depleted? And we lost all these calves, and we've got a dead carcass on the beach because another ship hit it. This was a tough one to swallow, really tough one to swallow. So the Great Whale Conservancy supports the following methods of eliminating ship strikes on blue and other great whales. The separation of the ships and the whales, preferably in space or where geographic, geographical constraints exist then in time. In space, move the shipping lanes away from the whale critical habitat. Very simple. But you can't always do it. When you can't do it with blue whales, we have another thing to play with. Shift traffic from nighttime when the whales are most vulnerable to being struck to daytime when they are least vulnerable. Well, actually, in a second. Three dive profiles, actual suction cup detag dive profiles from blue whales. Here we go, Southern California, Chile, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. In all three instances, the shaded areas are nighttime, and the lighter areas are daytime. Krill, it turns out, is photosensitive. It doesn't like light. So light drives it down about 300 meters. But it actually prefers to be at or near the surface. So the blue whale dye profiles mirror where the krill are. Need I say more? They're more vulnerable at night because the krill are up on the surface all night and the blue whales are up on the surface all night within the draft of the ships. So if we can shift traffic from nighttime to daytime in areas where it's impossible to move the shipping lanes, we're going to save blue whale lives for sure. And we're trying to do that very actively right now in both Southern California and Chile. And we're a little bit more active in Chile than Southern California because, believe it or not, it's easier to deal with this issue in Chile than it is in California. That might shock you, but it's a fact. Here's when they're at risk. Beautiful picture of a blue whale at a time of the day when it begins to be at risk, if it happens to be in an area where there's a shipping lane. Baja, California, there's no blue whales anywhere in the world that are safer than the ones in Baja, California. There's nothing that happens there to endanger them. Okay, I'm gonna take you on a really quick tour of what we're trying to do in Chile. And I'm going down there in a couple of months. We've got Southern South America. We've got Northern Patagonia. It's not a very pretty place, but we'll suffer when we go down there. As I said, it's not a very pretty, pretty place, but we'll suffer when we go down there. There's penguins, unfortunately. We'll have to suffer with them. There's Andean condors, the most massive winged bird on Earth. Hopefully, they won't poop on me. There's Peel's dolphins, 
will suffer with them. There's incredible temperate rainforest. We'll slog our way through that. Okay, we're zeroing in now on Puerto Montt and northern Patagonia. This is the Argentinian border. Argentina here, Chile here, Isla Chiloje here. Critical area number one, Los Lagos. No easy access from shore. The area in northern Patagonia where there's more blue whales than any area, but there's not very much known about them because it's mostly aerial surveys and the odd liveaboard that give the biologists that we're teaming up with down there the data that they have to know that this is a, a real problem area. Interestingly enough, no shipping lanes there. They've never been designated. That's a feather in our cap because we're working with the industry who's interested in designating shipping lanes in the more whale-free parts of the Los Lagos area. Chaco Channel, this is a real problem because every boat that comes goes in between this island and the mainland here to get to Puerto Montt and the boats that are coming up from the south, Tierra del Fuego, leave through the Chaco Channel. And it's a fairly, it's a crossroads, it's a, it's a problem area, problem area number two. Chiloe Island offshore, a lot of whales, but not much of a problem area because the cruise ships never go there and the container ships only go there if they're not calling in at Puerto Montt. So we're not very concerned with it. We think the whales are going to do okay in Chiloe Island offshore. Moraleda Channel, another crossroads. Every boat, whether it's a cargo or a container ship, goes through the Moraleda Channel. And then the area that we're focusing in for our first fix, the Gulf of Corcovado and Ancud. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at this uh, Gulf of Corcovado and Ancud and this area in particular. These are the ship routes, large vessel routes. So all cruise ships go this way. Every single one, no matter which way it's going, goes this way because every cruise ship wants to see 10,000 foot snow-capped volcanoes, penguins, dolphins, beautiful scenery, and they all want to call into Puerto Montt. Every container ship that wants a call in at the port goes this way, but the ones that don't are going up to the larger cities further up the coast and they go offshore. Okay, we're really zoomed in now. The entrance to Puerto Montt is here. This is the Gulf of Corcovado and Ancud, where we're zooming in right now. This is where the cruise ships go. There's sea lions and penguins here, so they go here. This is where the container ships go. They don't care about... Uh, penguins and sea lions. They care about getting their container to port. This is five years worth of blue whale sightings by a group called Mary. Wow, isn't that amazing? Here's the routes of the ships. All we need to do to start with is to get the cruise ships to basically say, you know what, through this little area, god darn it, we agree, we'll go this way. And in verbally, they've already agreed, we've got a little more work to do. We're going to hope to get this thing done by this next season, at the beginning of 2019. I think we got a good shot to succeed for, for that as a starter. Then we got to work on the daytime, nighttime issue, which we're working on with both container and cruise ships. Um, just to show you, uh, Barbara's our teammate, Barbara Galetti. She's been working down there for years. She's great. I love her. And I'm going down to spend some time with her in about two months. Here's a dead blue whale in Puerto Montt Bay, ship strike victim. This really happens there. Um, here's one, uh, you know, here's another blue whale. And yeah, no, it's the same blue whale. Just to show you that this really does happen there. Okay, a critical slide. Um, we're working on this daytime, nighttime issue. So the industry has seen this. I put it together. We've got sunrises in the three key blue whale months and sunsets in the middle of each month. But that gives us the whale safe transit times. Remember, we want them transiting through these critical areas in the daytime, and we don't want them transiting through at night. So this is sort of the key slide that we're using to fix the situation in Chile. And the industry you know, really likes this. And they're doing a whole lot of data on all of their ship transits in the last year, and they're working with us, and they're gonna, you know, we're gonna share all that data. Next meeting coming up in October when I do my next talk in DC, where these industries are based. Okay, we're gonna say goodbye to the blue whales. They drop beautiful waterfalls. This happens to be Machete. It's one of my favorite waterfall dive pictures. Our thank yous 
uh, we always have these dolphins that provide our thank yous for us. <laughs> and we're going to go on to the next slide, and we're going to play it and enjoy it. understand these natural cycles of evolution, which are responsible for all these amazing creatures. All of them making up this rich ecosystem are so amazing, so beautiful, so exquisite, and we mustn't let them all vanish. Blue whales are our counterparts in the ocean. They're big brain, sentient animals. The biggest animal to ever live. Bigger than any dinosaur ever. And they have the loudest voice on the planet. They can hear each other over thousands of miles. I hear a distant humpback and a distant fin whale. And there's that one lone blue whale. back in the days of whaling, which wasn't so long ago. They were hunted to near extinction, down to about 2% of their population. And they still haven't rebounded, partly because off the coast of California, we put our shipping lanes right in the middle of their prime feeding grounds. And they're getting decimated by shipping traffic. I feel that there's some hope the problem is that most people really don't have an idea of what a blue whale looks like. Even if they see it in real life, they don't really get to see it for very long. They see it fleetingly. some species, for some environments, it's too late. I think that it's when we stop and sense the wonder of the natural world. That's when we understand that there's still a lot left that's worth fighting for. It's really very, very inspiring, and it's the one thing that gives me greatest hope for the future. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much.